Okay, let's give this a shot. I don't know if <laughs> maybe I don't know if people in the in-person audience will be able to hear me, but I'm just gonna go ahead anyway and just say a quick hello and welcome to everybody, at least online. I'm joining online over Zoom. So it's very nice to have that that option available these days. So um, thanks to Alvin Norbaum for setting that up. Also, first of all, a really big thank you to Lourdes for organizing the, the banquet. It's a lot of work. And I think um, it, so it sounds like it's going really well. Uh, so I'm very happy to see that, um, that it's going forth in both uh, in person and remotely um, this year. Um, so hello, welcome. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say, but um, I, our first, this is not a normal um, uh, meeting, so we don't do the um, sort of the, the protocol of our um, in, in session meetings. The first meeting of the fall session will be October 7th, um, Thursday, October 7th, and the speaker will be Akito Kawahara from the University of Florida. So look for an email from, from Al Norbaum um, announcing that. Um, with that, I, I, I'd just like to say thanks again to, to Lourdes and to Al for organizing. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Lourdes and she'll announce the speaker. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, Jamie. And then we'll turn on the screen to, oh, you can do it. Cecilia can do it. Yeah. <clears throat> How do I? There we go. Right? Yeah. Mr. Wilson. <laughs> I am right away. <laughs> Little thing. So as I said before, uh, I'm Lord tomorrow, and I'm president elect of the Animal Logical Society of Washington, and it's the organization that has put together this mm -hmm. event. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> Should we mute this? Can you do that? Um, logistics going on just because we're there's some feedback. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, no. <laughs> maybe turn the volume down. We had it muted, so maybe so mute that one. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, excellent. So um, again, welcome. And the Entomological Society of Washington, uh, as some of you may or may not know, well, all of you probably do, but maybe the ones who are over Zoom don't, don't know this, but it is one of the oldest entomological societies in the Americas, and it was co-founded in 1884 by U.S. Department of Agriculture scientists, um, C.B. Riley, E.A. Schwartz, and L.O. Howard. And um, the first meeting was held in C.B. Riley's home in Washington, D.C to discuss entomological matters. And here we find ourselves again in our annual banquet, which is held every year, uh, to discuss uh, matters of entomology. And um, we've been holding this event here at uh, Wood End um, Sanctuary and Mansion for several years now. And we'd like to acknowledge their support and, um, over these many years. And, um, and they've also redone their garden. So if you've had the opportunity to look at that, that would be really great because it's, um, it's very timely indeed um, with, with the topic of, of our, of our um, talk today. And I'm very excited to, to be introducing uh, Dr. Talamy today. And this is very personal because we were, um, um, his books have actually helped us with the transformation of our own yard and to change our property into what he calls a homegrown national park, um, where you bring a uh, habitat for native species. And Dr. Talamy is a visionary who started uh, this grassroots effort to promote the use of native plants in the home garden. Uh, Dr. Doug Talamy is the TA Baker Professor of Agriculture and Natural Resources in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he teaches courses dealing with insect ecology and conservation, and has mentored more than 28 masters and PhD students 
for more than 40 years. He earned his PhD from the University of Maryland and his research focuses on insect ecology, primarily insect behavioral ecology, conservation of um, biodiversity, impact of alien plants on native ecosystems and plant insect interactions. Dr. Talmi has published more than 104 research publications, as well as four highly acclaimed award-winning books, um, which again are available here at, our, at the bookstore with a discount. And he'll be signing them um, during the, the event. His first book, Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants was published in 2007. And this awakened the public to the decline of wildlife and it was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, uh, co-authored with Rick uh, Dark, was published in 2014. Nature's Best Hope was a New York Times bestseller and was out uh, in February of 2020. And his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released in March of this year, 2021. Dr. Talamy has uh, several awards, among them Garden Club of America, Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation, Tom Dodd Junior Award of Excellence in, in 2013, the 2018 AHSBY Morrison Communication Award, and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Doug Talamy. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm not a visionary. I do specialize in the obvious, though, and that's what we're going to we're going to talk about today. I don't talk to entomologists. I can't remember the last time I talked to entomologists. So this is a little scary because you guys you know the answers. Already. I call this making insects, restoring the little things, a guide to restoring the little things that run the world, but you guys already know how to make insects. So we'll just look at the pretty pictures. <laughs> of course, the story starts with the, the guy who, who, that's his phrase, where little insects are the little things that, that run the world, and that's uh, E.O. Wilson. I usually spend a lot of time telling you who E.O. Wilson is, but you know who he is. So I'll actually tell you a story about E.O. Wilson. I met him in 1982. I had just gotten my job at the University of Delaware and there was a uh, meeting in Boulder, Colorado on social insects. At the time I was working on social behavior in lace books. So I went to this meeting, but it was a small meeting and there were a lot of, not very many people there, uh, but EO was there and he was, he was giving the, the big address. Um, so they had talks in the morning and then it was, it was small enough that uh, people just went outside and milled around during the break. And I went outside and here's EO sitting on the curb and nobody's sitting next to him. I'm actually a shy guy, um, but I got up my nerve. I'm gonna go sit next to EO Wilson. Went, sat down next to me, turned, he looked at me, he put his hand out, he said, hi, I'm Ed Wilson. I don't believe we met. I said, no, we haven't met, I'm joking. So we talked for a few minutes and, and then we were best buddies. Um, break was over, went in, more talks, lunch, more talks, then another break in the afternoon. And I went outside and here's EO sitting on the curb and nobody's sitting next to him. So I went over and sat next to him because we were buddies then. And he turned and he looked at me, he said, hi, I'm Ed Wilson, I don't believe we met. <laughs> <laughs> That's my EO story. Uh, in 1987, he wrote this paper, uh, The Little Things That Run the World. And I still remember sitting in my office at the University of Delaware, reading this paper for the first time. And his message was very clear that life, as we know, it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. And if most of the flowering plants disappeared, it would so drastically change energy flow through our ecosystems that, that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would collapse and all of those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost we have an issue here. We would have lost our, our insect decomposers. So all we'd have is bacteria, fungi. <laughs> Point is, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. So I read this and I, and I said, um, well, that, that's cool. But this was 1987. What is this little thing?
There we go. Now it's not advancing. Okay, I got it again. All right. Um, it, it, you know, I thought it was cool, but nobody was worried about losing insects in 1987. So it was a somber message, but it was it was ignored. Um, besides, if if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? Now this was 1929, but uh, and it was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects, not insect pests. All insects, all insects are are bad, um, and that you know that is part of our culture, folks. You know that. All if you see an insect, you kill it, and then you ask questions later. Even if we do succeed in killing all the insects in our homes and all the insects in our agriculture, we haven't been worried about losing insects because we think they're still common in our, our natural areas. There's two reasons why that's not true anymore. And one of them is we don't have enough natural areas. Uh, that's what the night light of the US looks like. Um, and that's because we have turned those natural areas into our cities and they're not designed to support insects. We've turned them into our suburbs and they're not de designed to support anything. Uh, we even our rural areas are not designed to support insects. And of course we have agriculture, 770 million acres of rangeland in the US that's four and a half times the size of Texas, not designed to support insects. Uh, and it's typically overgrazed so that it doesn't even support the cattle. Almost one half of terrestrial earth is dedicated to some form of agriculture and none of it is designed to support insects. The second reason that insects are not doing well in our natural area is not just that they're small and isolated, but they are thoroughly overrun with non-native species. Uh, now this place looks pretty good here, but I had to drive here and you look out the window, you know what it, what it looks like. This is a natural area. This is White Clay Creek State Park in, in North Delaware. Every bit of green you see there is a plant from Asia because in March they leaf out before plants from North America and I took this picture. Of and it's all our favorites, multiflora, rose and oriental, bittersweet, and Japanese honeysuckle and bush, honeysuckle and autumn olive. And, and uh, about a third of the vegetation in heavily invaded places is from Asia at this point. And those plants are not good at supporting insects and we'll talk about why in a second. Uh, and because they're not, these plant invasions uh, are destroying insect populations in natural areas and in unnatural areas, all our managed landscapes where we landscape with about 80% non-native plants, we're destroying insect populations there as well for the same reason. In our natural areas, or the US has been, we have more than 3,300 species of plants that have taken on some type of, of invasive quality in North America. Now, when I was growing up, and some of you here too probably remember, this is what night lights, street lights used to look like. There were insects flying around them all the time. This is what our windshields looked like when we drove around. We don't see that anymore. I know it's anecdotal, but we don't see it anymore. So we are winning this undeclared war against insects. <clears throat> and that's why we see headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? A bunch of, of statistics. You know, the first thing we get concerned about is decline of the honeybee, then the decline of the monarch, and then we start measuring other bees. Uh, and there's, there's good data from both North America and Europe showing that uh, the insects we care about are in decline. You know, four species of bumblebees have declined 96% in the last 20 years, which means they're not extinct, but they are functionally extinct. They're no longer performing their roles in their ecosystems. There are three species of bumblebees that may already be extinct. You got to go, I don't know how many years without seeing one before you they're declared extinct. 25% of our bumblebee species at risk of extinction. Europe uh, is, Europe does a better job of measuring things, but they're certainly not better off than we are. About 30% of Europe's orthopterans are facing extinction. Um, England, England measures and counts everything, but uh, their insects are, are in, in bad shape, particularly their moths and butterflies. <clears throat> They've gotten rid of their, their habitat. Of course, a lot of this started with a big study out of Germany saying that uh, lost 79% of their flying insects since 1989. 46 species of moths and butterflies have already disappeared from Germany. Uh, then Durzo says, well, you know, globally, we've lost 45% of our invertebrate 
populations. Of course, most of those are, are insects. So <clears throat> insects are what birds eat and lots of other things, but we care about birds. And as insects decline, so do the birds. We now have 3 billion fewer breeding birds in North America compared to actually it's 50 years ago. 3 billion fewer breeding birds. So not just, not just uh, the birds that, that fly by. Uh, and that's almost a third of our North American bird population. There are 432 species of North American birds that are threatened with extinction. Not because there's only five left of each one, but because their, their population declines uh, are precipitous at this point. We need to worry about the common species that are declining. The rare species are already contributing very little to our ecosystems, but the common species are running them. And when they steeply decline, it's a real serious uh, threat. We went to the uh, data set, Rosenberg et al.'s data set uh, from the Smithsonian. Who, they're the group that said we have lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years, and we divided those birds uh, into two groups, the terrestrial birds into the, the species that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the species that don't require insects. So things like the uh, doves and the finches can actually reproduce on seeds. They didn't lose any numbers in the last 50 years, but the species that require insects on average lost 10 million individuals per species over the last 50 years. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggested that as you take the insects away that these birds need, the birds aren't gonna do really well. Um, of note is that the invasive birds we have here that came from England, the English sparrow and the starling, in England, they're both red listed now because there's so few of them left. And that's because England has sterilized its, its ecosystems to the point where even our sparrows and starlings can't mate. And that's why we have this headline. The UN now predicts we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, possibly in the next 20 years. And most of those will be insects. And I love the way they report it as if it's just one more headline. In my view, they might as well say we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline. We cannot afford to lose a million species. These are the species that run the ecosystems that support us. So what are we gonna do about it? Does it matter? Well, you know, the creatures that keep us alive are disappearing. I, it seems like that, that should matter. But it's really <laughs> tough to Stop. convince people to act on anything. We are terrible at acting on, on anything is perceived as a long-term threat. Um, but we're pretty good at feeling protective of other, other animals. So I want you to pretend you're another animal. I want you to view insect decline from the perspective of a bird. You're going to be a magnolia warbler. And by the way, magnolia warblers are migrating right now. So <clears throat> imagine you're a magnolia warbler, only it's springtime. You have just finished overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of Costa Rica, and it is time for you to fly north so that you can reproduce which means you're gonna migrate, which means you're gonna do the most uh, dangerous thing you will ever do in your life. Migration is very risky. Predation risks are high. Physiological costs are enormous. Migrants lose up to 35% of their, their body weight when they're crossing the Gulf. As a matter of fact, every time they fly and they can go up to 300 miles in a, in a single night over land, they'll lose 50 to 35 to 50% of their body weight. So when they stop, at what we call rest uh, stopover points. It's not to rest really, it's to refuel. What are they refueling on? They're, they're eating insects. They've got to gas up so they can continue their migration. So migration is extremely costly. And you might wonder why, as you as a, as a magnolia warbler, why migration evolved? A little about for the same reason anything evolves. The benefits of migrating exceeded the cost. Costs are high, but the benefits were even higher. What are the benefits of migrating? There's more food. In the temperate zone, of course, in the spring, we have this giant flush of leaves. And following the giant flush of leaves is a giant flush of the insects that eat those leaves, largely caterpillars. And it provides a tremendous resource for migrating birds, not just to fuel the migration, but to fuel the reproduction once they get here. That seasonal flush of food um, doesn't happen in huge areas of the tropics, particularly the wet tropics. The tropics are extremely uh, even, uh, so they're 
there's always a lot of competition. There's always uh, a shortage of food, things to uh, well, meet each other for food. So any bird that recognized, we have an issue here. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, bye. <laughs> ah, well, treat this as a, a stopover point. You're a magnolia warbler and you need to rest. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now we're good. Are we good? Yep. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a drink if I take the top off here. <laughs> All right. The food in the temperate zone gave migrants um, a, a resource that they could, it was an opportunity they did not have in the tropics. We're back to, I can't advance it. Okay, thank you. If they stay in the tropics, on average, they rear two to four offspring. If they move to the temperate zone, they could rear three to six. And that advantage in reproduction was enough um, to balance the huge costs of, of migration. It gave them a competitive edge. So my bird migration was uh, only adaptive because there was a huge food resource in the temperate zone, insects. How important are, are insects to birds? Somebody actually measured that a couple of years ago. Uh, and the estimate was that birds eat 500 million tons of insects on planet Earth every year. And of course, this was presented as, look how valuable birds are in terms of controlling pests. Sure. Because remember, all insects are, are pests. Let's rewrite that and say that birds require 500 million tons of insects every year to be birds. And if you reduce the amount of insects, you're going to reduce the amount of birds. I'm talking about birds because people care about birds. But an awful lot of things out there eat insects that we're not talking about. So this is just, birds are just an index of what's happening to all those insectivores. Now, when migration evolved, there were plenty of insects in the temperate zone. It wasn't an issue. Is that still the case? Are there enough insects to justify the cost of migration? Because when you as a magnolia warbler fly north, you still have those costs. The question is, do you have the benefits when you, when you get here? Uh, and every time we measure it, the answer to that question is no. Let's just look at the impact of non-native plants on insect populations. Whether or not they're invasive, they're in our landscapes. And we have been studying this for the last 15 years. Uh, and, and I can give you uh, papers to read if you, if you really want to. But this is one of the, the recent papers that came out, just a very simple study with an undergrad we went into hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware that were invaded, in this case, autumn olive and lots of other things, uh, and measured caterpillars in a, a controlled way uh, and compared them to the caterpillar populations in hedgerows that were not invaded. And the trick was to find hedgerows that were not invaded. But in clover leaves, you know, you know where you can find that where there aren't any deer because the deer and the evasives are, are correlated. Anyway, we found some. We counted the caterpillars, and there was a 68% reduction in the number of species in the invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the actual energy provided by caterpillars in those invaded hedgerows. This doesn't affect just a few birds. Most of our birds are neotropical migrants. We're talking about hummingbirds. We're talking about 386 species of neotropical migrants that may not have enough food when they come up to the temperate zone to justify that migration anymore. All the swallows and the swifts, the orioles, the hummingbirds, the vireos, the tanagers, the buntings, the flycatchers, the thrushes, the warblers. I mean, what's left? The bobolinks, the, uh, the night jars, all those guys are, are migrating. They all depend on insects. Uh, and most of them are in steep decline. And don't forget the, the birds that are not migrating. The residents that stay here continue to eat insects in the wintertime along with seeds, but then when they're reproducing, they switch entirely to insects. This is the figure I always throw around for Carolina chickadees. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees, one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's to get them to the point where they leave the nest, when they fledge. After they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars 
for another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make a tiny bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do, because in so many places, that's all that's left is our yards. You have to have all these caterpillars in your yard. Chickadees forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. So when we landscape with, with ginkgos, we had a discussion with somebody about how nice ginkgos are. Um, they're a wonderful or ornamental tree, but in essence, they produce zero species of caterpillars. So people say, well, I don't have a property big enough to support breeding birds. If you have a property big enough to support one tree, you can help migrating birds because they're flying right through our cities. They're not going around humans. They go right through. And when it comes about 5 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning, they come down and they've got to find food when they come down. If they're in the land of ginkgo, they're not going to find any. What if I said to you, introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 96%? I would get your attention because we get it that we need, we need currency to live. Insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. And if I could get that message to the general public, we'd be in good shape because then we'd stop the war on insects. It's our ecological bank account that keeps us alive. We have to start taking it seriously. So I think our only viable option is to start to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us. And it sustains us by sustaining all the things that support us. Where are we gonna do that? How are we gonna do that? We, we have to address conservation on private property because most of the country's privately owned. 78% 78 of the entire country is private, privately owned. And 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't do a conservation on private property, we're gonna fail. And if we fail, we're gonna fail. So we're talking about making insects on a property like this. I took this from a helicopter. It's a, one of the properties around here. Here's the guy mowing the lawn and it looks pretty, but it's an ecological dead zone. How do we turn that into an area that, that will actually contribute to local ecosystems instead of detract from them? Well, first let's, let's talk about the causes of insect declines. There are many. Dave Wagner calls it the death by a thousand cuts because there's so many different things contributing to insect declines. But these are the big ones, the misuse and overuse of pesticides. In other words, industrial agriculture, habitat loss, you know, you know what habitat loss is. Plant choice, we'll talk about that. Those invasive species that we, we've already mentioned. Light pollution is turning out to be a big one that has been underestimated. And of course we have climate change. I see this as good news. Because the average Joe, the average homeowner, the average everybody can address all five of these easily, quickly, overnight, starting tomorrow. If I said you got to change climate change by tomorrow, that'd be, that'd be tough. So let's talk about what we can do to each one of these causes of insect decline. We're talking about raising the bar about how we landscape, where we live, where we work, where we play. Let's, let's talk about where we live, though. <clears throat> In the past, we have decorated our landscapes with pretty plants. Uh, and because we thought plants were just decorations, we could go all over the world and find the prettiest ones and plant them. Uh, so our plant choice focused entirely on aesthetics with no thought to the ecological value of the plants that we're trying to put into our, our landscapes. Uh, and, and when you landscape like that, come back here, you can create beautiful landscapes, but they're, they're ecological dead stones. That's when landscaping equals ecological destruction. What if we picked pretty plants that actually had uh, a, a number of ecosystem services? They supported food webs and you're not gonna do that without insects. Protecting our watershed, storing carbon, um, creating pollinator habitats, really important. Um, if we add function to the criteria that we use when we're selecting plants, then landscaping equals e ecosystem restoration. And I'm gonna call this 21st century landscaping. We've done 20th century landscaping. We're now in the sixth grade extinction. It's not working. So let's try something, something new. What does this have to do with making insects? We can't restore ecosystems without restoring insect populations. So let's, let's get down to business. First, we have to decide which insects we're gonna, we're gonna help. There are a lot of them out there. 
three to four million species is the latest estimate that I've heard. Who, who wants to correct me? What's the latest, the real latest one? Is that close? Good enough. Um, what we have, one point something described species. So most of these are still und undescribed. We've got 164,000 described species in the US, but I can still uh, pretty easily come up with undescribed species in my, my yard. So there's a lot of them. But that's a lot of species to get into our yards. Which one should we focus on? Uh, I think we should focus on the two most important groups. And in doing that will help a lot of other insects as well. But we need to focus on the insects that maintain plant diversity. Remember, plants are capturing the energy from the sun and turning it into food. We, we need them. So we want to maintain that plant diversity. And then we want to focus on the insects that contribute the most energy to food webs, the insects that take the energy that the plants harness and pass it up, up the food web. What are those two groups? Well, we're talking about pollinators, of course, and we're also talking about caterpillars. Everybody knows about caterpillars. Not that many people know how important caterpillars are. Well, I'm not gonna say much about pollinators tonight because you already know everything about, about pollinators. And it's gotten a lot of press. The entire country is interested in pollinators and that's, that's great. Um, there are a few things that I would, I would like to correct. Um, why do we need pollinators? NPR, all forms of, the, public, of the, the media will tell you we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. Every third mouthful that you eat depends on a pollinator. Well, May, May Berenbaum actually looked at that statistic and she has no idea where it came from. <laughs> uh, she, she, the closest she could estimate was that one seventh of all of the food is pollinated by, by pollinators. And out of, that's in a good diet, we eat lots of, of fruits and vegetables and, and nuts. Uh, but most people eat a lot of corn and soybeans and then it's one twelfth of your diet depends on, on insects. So I don't like the, poly, the agriculture argument because people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. The real reason we need pollinators not a third of a crop, it's because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That's not an option. It's not an option. When we're talking about these things, we're not talking about good land stewardship, we're talking about essential land stewardship. And we don't use that word enough. This is stuff we have to do. It's not optional. That's it, that's all I'm gonna say about caterpillars, about Pollinators, let's talk about caterpillars because they, they're more fun. They're the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. According to Dan Jansen anyway, he says that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals, particularly vertebrates, uh, than any other, not just any other insect, but any other type of animal. If we develop landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars, uh, there's a high, high probability that will uh, be a failed food web in that, that landscape. So it's really about making caterpillars. That also gives you a really handy index. You can, you can measure the quality of your local ecosystem by counting the caterpillar species. And that's fun. So if we're just talking about fixing our yards, how do we increase the number of caterpillars in our yards? Well, you add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that make those caterpillars. And that, that sounds pretty easy. Um, there is a catch though. And that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to have the right plants or it's not gonna work. Uh, and most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars because most plants don't wanna be eaten. They protect themselves from caterpillars. They load the leaves with nasty compounds uh, that, that uh, <clears throat> deter an awful lot of, of caterpillars. Uh, it's a very effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat the plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. So it's a good defense, it works, but insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. You know, this is where the, the, uh, the nation's fixation on the monarch butterfly has been a good thing because the monarch is a perfect example of host plant specialization. You can have all the boxwood and all the breadfruit pears and all the crepe myrtles that you want. You won't make a single monarch. You gotta have milkweed. And the, the public started to, to figure that out. Well, that's true with 90% of the insects that, that eat plants. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. 
And an insect species can't adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are really similar in, in the defenses that they use and they get good at getting around those. It's circumventing. They develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the exposure of the insect to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, then the insects locked into eating that particular plant lineage. That's why when you take the milkweed out of your yard and you replace it with crepe myrtle, you don't make any monarchs and it doesn't switch, it disappears. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild food webs, uh, we have to choose plants very carefully or it's not going to work. <clears throat> if I want the Pandora Sphinx in my yard, and I, I do, you gotta have Virginia creeper or, or one of the, the native grapes, but they really prefer Virginia creeper. And it's a beautiful mark, who wouldn't want that? Uh, so we'll just do a bunch of these here. These are all specialists. If I want the tulip tree, Silk moth, I've got to have tulip trees. The luna moth specializes in various places around the country. Around here, it's largely sweet gum. Zebra swallowtail, definite specialist. You're not going to have that if you don't have pawpaw. Um, there are a lot of things that are on grape seeds, but at barster moth, for example, on, on grapes. These are just examples of the things that have specialized on various plant lineages. The green marble on viburnum. Goldenrod supports 110 species of caterpillars in this area like the beautiful uh, brown hooded ally. Even poison ivy has specialists, like the beautiful utilia. I know what you're gonna say, I can't have poison ivy. You know when you get poison ivy? When you try to pull it out, leave it alone. You can run faster than it can. The, the defense against all, <laughs> really the defense is to learn what it looks like and just don't touch it. It also makes really valuable berries for the birds in the fall, very high in fat. Sculpture moth on persimmon, the hebrew on black gum, the, our poor beleaguered ashes support a lot of the sphinx moths, particularly the fawn sphinx, which is just gorgeous. I think that that's art in the garden. Equally gorgeous, the rosy maple moth on maples. Maples, very powerful plants. The royal walnut moth on walnut and hickory. Um, it's already extirpated from New England. This is, you know, one of our most beautiful moths is already gone from New England. Double tooth prominent on elm, witch hazel dagger moth on witch hazel, imperial moth on pine. Even our, our native clematis supports things like the spotted thyrus. Two toned down ancillus on ironwood, the lost outlet on button bush, the herald on native willows, the snowberry clearwing on coral honeysuckle. The beautiful evening primrose moth is on evening primrose, believe it or not. And this is how it spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. <laughs> it's very cute. Showy Emeron, Sumac. Then we've got some real powerhouses. Things like our native prunus, particularly in this area of black, black cherry. 456 species supported by black cherry in the mid-Atlantic states. Things like the white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, beautiful cecropia moth, the colorful zale, the tufted bird dropping moth. <laughs> Who would not want the tufted bird dropping moth in their yard? You can have fun just saying the name. The paddle caterpillar. This is educational. Send your kids outside, tell them, put the phone down, go out and find a paddle caterpillar, paddle caterpillar, and then figure out what those paddles are for. They're not decorations, they have a function. It's the same function that the filaments on the filament geometer. Now, don't tell them what they're for. I'm not going to tell you either. Because <laughs> you already know, you're in tomorrow. Uh, the small ice fangs, these guys are all on, on, on cherry. Harris is three spot. This little umbrella that they hold over their, their head is. Out of, it's made out of shed head capsules. You didn't know what that was for for, for a long time. But if you touch one of these, they whack you with it. It's a defense. They want to, don't want you to touch them. And then oak, the most productive plant in 84% of the counties in North America in which it occurs, supports things like the hag moth, the red wash prominent, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak moth, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, the orange packed smoky moth, the half oval ancillus, the crown slug, the pink striped bookworm, the beautiful spun glass slug, which I think is the, just the coolest caterpillar in North America for sure, plus literally hundreds more. Oaks are what I call keystone plants, and there's not many of them. It turns out that just 5% of our native plants are supporting 75% of the caterpillar species uh, in, in North America. 
14% of our native plants are supporting 90% of the caterpillar species. So I call them keystone plants because remember what a keystone is. This is the, the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. If you take this, the keystone out, the arch falls down. If we take keystone plants out of our food webs, the food web collapses. They're making most of the food. Mid-Atlantic states have support 557 species of caterpillars. You know what tulip trees support? 21. Tulip tree is a great tree, but it's not, it's not an oak. It makes a big difference when you have a tulip tree monoculture compared to one that has lots of oaks. 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are gonna hold up that house. They're supporting it. They're not optional. You can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been doing. That's why our ecological houses are falling apart. They're not the only thing your house is made out of, but they're an essential component. How do you find out what the keystone species are for, for your area? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and you get the ranked list for the best plants in terms of supporting caterpillars in your county. Excuse me, and this is true for anywhere in the, the country. Now notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and I say, I wanna buy a cherry, they will undoubtedly sell me an ornamental cherry from Asia. If I wanna buy a willow, they'll say me, sell me a weeping willow from Turkey. You gotta specify that you need a native member of these really important genera because uh, the non-native members, they, they don't support nothing, um, but there's a 65% reduction in caterpillar um, species and abundance when you don't get uh, native species in these particular genera. These are the top ranked herbaceous genera. Goldenrods always way up there. The various genera that asters are broken up into. Um, sunflowers, particularly as you move a little farther uh, west, the Midwest and the, and the far west, um, the perennial sunflowers. These are all very high in terms of supporting caterpillars that they're also really good in terms of supporting specialist bees. We'll talk more about that in a second. So there are at least 40 species of bees that won't be in your yard if you don't have those three genera in your yard. They can only reproduce on the pollen of particular uh, uh, plants, and, and those are the top producing ones in this area. You might wonder where I just took, where I took all the pictures that I just showed you. Um, I took them in my yard, and that's what my yard looked like when we moved in. Uh, this was a uh, farm, very old farm, been farmed for about 300 years. And the last thing they did before they broke it up into lots and sold them off was to mow it for hay. So they're very, very little there. Um, but one of the things we tried to do since we moved in was to put the plants back. We certainly have not put all the plants back, but we put a lot of plants back. I do have some lawn here. I'm very traditional. But I have been taking pictures of every species of moth that I have been able to find on our property. And I'm up to 1,134 species so far. I added two more yesterday. Um, so who knows where it's going to top at? We're getting, we're getting up there. It's getting harder to get new ones. And this is just moths. Does include the butterflies yet? We'll get there. Uh, so we have those species because we planted witch hazels and oaks and persimmons and elms and all of these things. They weren't on the property. We put them there. We tolerated a lot of things that came in on their own, like black cherry. Everybody says it's a weed. You got to get rid of it. Well, you can get rid of it, get rid of 456 species of, of, of moths if you do that. You know, grapes, nobody likes them. Uh, Virginia creeper, everybody groans. It's a great native plant. Even, even daughter, even poison ivy, all these things are lineages that are gonna add to the, the diversity and abundance of your caterpillar population and thus diversity and abundance of the things that eat those caterpillars like your birds. So we've added all those caterpillars and we've also added a lot of birds too. We've got wood thrush, breeding wood thrush on that piece of property that was mowed for hay uh, because we've got, we've got plants like Virginia creeper that make the lettered sphinx. That's what they feed their young. Indo indigo bunnies because we have alders that make ruby quakers. Shipping sparrows because we have black walnuts making gray edge boma locas. Field sparrows, because we have oaks making red line pen. Notice I took all these pictures at home too, because that's what the birds are doing there. Tough to tip mice, because we have black cherries making dowdy pinions. We've got Phoebe's breeding on the, the glass fixture over our front door, because we have a lot of native grasses making skippers. 
we have robins because we have the weeds that support the white line sphinx. Carolina chickadees because we have tulip trees making tulip tree beauties. White eyed vireos because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtails. House wrens because we have hickories making copper underwings. Bluebirds because we have sycamores making draft prominence and on and on and on. We have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our property on the 10 acres that we have. And not just flew by, but bred. That's the important thing. Why am I telling you that? Well, this is another, another headline that we saw last year. World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. And all I'm thinking is not at our house. I'm sure we have increased wildlife by two thirds. Now you can't just count rhinoceros as something. You gotta count the little guys. But we have increased biodiversity uh, by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long. And we did it simply by putting the plants back. So if you choose the right plants, if you use more of them, we could restore insects nearly everywhere. And I'm gonna leave you with nine things that you can do to restore the ecosystems in your yard by rebuilding the insect populations. And the most important one is going to be reduce your lawn. I say cut it in half. We've got 40 million acres of lawn in the US and that's a 2005 statistic. So you know we've got more than that. An ecological deadscape. That's the size of New England, dedicated to a status symbol. So I'm suggesting we cut that area in half, replant it with the powerful plants I'm talking about. That'll give us 20 million acres to put towards conservation. I drive past this, this uh, church in Mississippi uh, where everybody goes inside to worship God's creations and on the outside, they kill them all. Because <laughs> we're not thinking. Uh, and if we replant 20 million acres of the lawn that's out there, um, we can create what I'm calling Homegrown National Park, um, just with that area alone. And we now have a, a website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and I don't want to take any credit for this. I met a lady named Michelle Alpenderi a couple years ago who said, you only talk to the choir. And I said, only the choir invites me. <laughs> She said, you've got to reach the non-choir and I'm going to help you do that. I'm going to build this website and we're going to have a map and people can get on the map and it's going to be social media crazy and, and, and you're going to be competing with each other to, to help convert this 20 million acres. When you go on, you get yourself on the map by uh, putting in your location and the amount of lawn or area or anything that you're protecting with native vegetation and you will light up on the map and you're gonna to get to see everybody else light up in your county. We're working on it so that you can see everybody in the country who's lighting up. Um, Laura Jewett sitting right over here is helping with this as a volunteer and we're up to what, 10,500? Something like that, people on, on the map. Um, that's a good start, but we, if it was 10 million, 500,000, I would still say we're only starting. We got you know, 340 million people in this country. We need a lot of people on, on the map if this is gonna succeed. So Michelle says, this is how social media works. It's gonna work, I believe. Get on, get on the, by the way, it's free. And I know we're not using your data. I wouldn't know how to do that anyway. Use it for what? Okay, second thing you wanna do is plant for the specialist bees. You know, our own Sam Drogi right here says you, you save bee populations by planting for the specialists because if you plant for the specialists, the native bees use those plants as well. Um, you have to know what the, the specialists, what plants the specialists uh, use and the National Wildlife Federation website is using a lot of data from uh, Jared Fowler's work who was, who was one of Sam's students uh, to create lists of specialists of the plants that specialist bees require for every bioregion in the country. And that should be active soon. I think. So we wanna put those plants in our, our yards. We wanna re remove invasive species from our property. Remember 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If everybody got rid of the invasives from their private property, we'd be 85.6% done. And that would reduce the seed range so that they wouldn't come back as fast. Then we can work on the public properties. We also have to stop selling them in our nurseries. That would, that would help. Um, oh, these are, you know, you know what the, you know what the bad guys are. Porcelain berry, you know, it, it's mind boggling. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this anymore. Use keystone plants. That's a new concept for, for a lot of people. All natives are not equal. 85% of them are contributing, but not that much. 
use that 14, 15% that are driving the food webs, uh, at least for starters, and, and we will make a lot more headway. Landscape for catacombs, what do I mean by that? Now, this is just an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oak support is actually 511 species of, of catacombs. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from the branch, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 480 of those species, 94%, finish growing on the tree as a caterpillar, then they drop from the tree, wiggle their way beneath the ground, pupate underground, that's what most of them do, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we mow and compact our soils all around our plantings everywhere so that it's too hard for the caterpillars to get down. So this becomes an ecological trap. If these are the right species, the moths come in, lay their eggs, the caterpillars grow, and then drop down and die. And the next generation smaller and the next generation disappears. And then we have global insect decline. I'm convinced this is one of the major causes of insect decline um, pretty much everywhere we, we landscape. And of course, the cement landscape, we do want to get trees into our, our cities, absolutely, but do we need cement as a default landscape? That's the problem. This is what most people do. They have a tree in, in a yard full of grass, and nobody's measured how well caterpillars uh, make it through the winter in a situation like this, although we've started to do that. But I guarantee they do better in a situation like this. You have a tree, and you've got a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood here, an azalea, ferns, ground cover, Caterpillar drops down to a safe site. It's not compacted. Nobody's gonna mow it. Nobody's gonna step on it. It can get underground and pupate. It can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter. I guarantee there will be much higher survivorship when we actually measure it. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening, your fancy gardening. Most people who love the garden are, are, are gardening with pretty uh, annuals and, and perennials. Put them around your trees. Create safe sites where you're not gonna mow and you're not gonna compact the soil. They're great for the caterpillars. And use those ground covers uh, liberally, like wild ginger or, or may apple or ferns or, or foam flower. There's all kinds of them, again, around your trees. That allows safe sites for those caterpillars once they drop down. This is a, a uh, this is Athens, Georgia, a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any caterpillar that develops on these trees, even though this is the middle of a city, can drop down into this fern bed and actually complete its development. So we can improve the way we, we uh, landscape under our trees without a whole lot of effort across the country. Reduce your light pollution. You know, we can put in our keystone plants and attract a lot of insects to our yard and then kill them with our, our lights at night. And that of course is not the, not the goal. These are all the ways that, that light pollution kills particularly moths, but it's all those nocturnal insects. Um, but you know, this, to me, this is, this is more good news, believe it or not. We have to reverse insect decline. We can't ignore that anymore. We got to reverse it, not just stall it, but we have to reverse it. If we can do that by flicking a switch at night, we're getting up easy. That's pretty easy to do. But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn the light off over my garage because the bad man will come. Put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to find out is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, Take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to uh, nocturnal insects than white wavelengths. And yellow LED lights are the least attractive and also they're using the least amount of electricity. If we turn, took out the white bulbs that we light up the world with and put in yellow bulbs overnight, we'd save billions of insects and billions of dollars because it's more energy efficient. Oppose mosquito spray. I know mosquitoes are annoying. I have been bitten by it, but this is, this is Mosquito Joe. It is a booming industry around the country. Really took off when Zika didn't come to Florida. Few people with it did, but they started spraying in New York City immediately because Zika wasn't in Florida. You know, spraying in Camden, New Jersey is mandatory. You cannot opt out of it because of malaria. There was malaria in Camden, New Jersey, but I think it was 1750 was the last time it was there. Mosquito Joe will tell you that it's okay because that's a natural product and it is. It's, it's pyrethroids, chrysanthemums, uh, but cyanide is a natural product too, so I'm not sure that's a good argument. He'll also say 
it only kills mosquitoes. And that's where he's leading you astray. I don't know if you saw the headlines last year, right at this time during peak monarch migration, mosquito Joe, hundreds of monarchs dead on the ground. This kills all the insects it comes in contact with. The big thing is it doesn't work. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 50 to, to 90, no, you have to kill 90% of the adult population. Mosquito Joe kills 10 to 50% of the adult population. He doesn't come close to actually controlling the, the mosquito population, which is why he has to keep coming back and back and back and charging you a lot of money for something that doesn't work and kills lots of non-targets. If you really wanna kill mosquitoes, you attack them in the larval stage and this would be a very simple thing that homeowners could do, use mosquito dumps. You get a bucket, people say, how big a bucket? I don't care, <laughs> the bigger the better. Fill it full of water, put in a handful of, of straw or hay, or maybe dead grass, we're not sure. If what you're doing is creating a, a cocktail that's irresistible to ovipositing mosquitoes it, because it, that's where the diatoms and the algae grow and that's what the mosquito are. Then you throw in a mosquito dunk, which you buy at the hardware store for nine bucks and the mosquito eggs hatch and they nibble on that and it kills them. This is Bacillus thuringiensis that kills aquatic dipter. The only aquatic dipter in, in your bucket is a mosquito. Uh, so it's very targeted. If the dragonfly gets in there, it doesn't hurt it. If your dog licks it, it doesn't hurt it. The bird drinks it, it's okay. Put a screen over top though, so the chipmunk doesn't drown. Uh, but you know, if everybody did this, we would cut down on the mosquitoes for sure. The other great producer of mosquitoes that people don't think about is your, your sewer drains in, in the street. They're always, they have two or three inches of water in there all the time, They're breeding mosquitoes like crazy. Throw some mosquito dunks down there. Minimize insecticide use overall. Homeowners use a fantastic amount of insecticide. Go to the hardware store and look at the shelves of hundreds of kinds of, of insecticides that they're selling you so that you can get your box elder bug before it doesn't eat your house. And, and all the spiders that are helping you eat the mosquitoes, gotta kill them too. Minimize your insecticides. My pants are falling down. <laughs> Termites will eat your house. So, so, you know, we do have to control them, but that's about the only thing that's, that's absolutely necessary. Everything else is, is uh, it's entomophobia. People don't like insects and that's not a good reason to be killing the world. Finally, how do we change all the rules that say we can't landscape the way I think we should, that our HOA, our Homeowners Association says, you have to have non-native plants, you have to have all lawn, it's gotta be this tall. Join your HOA and change from within. I've been saying this for a few years. Um, I didn't really believe it would work, but I'm getting emails from people who have done that and say, it works, they're listening. You know, people made the rules in HOAs back in the 70s. They didn't want rusty cars in the front row, front yard. I understand that, but people can change the rules too. We're not as unreasonable as, as the news makes us sound. So. All right, I'm gonna end the way I started with, with uh, my good buddy, Theo. He write, he's 92 now, and he still writes a book every year. This is the book he wrote in, in um, 2016, Half Earth. Has anybody read Half Earth? It's always one person. <laughs> Thank you. Our planets fight for life. He's, he has spent the bulk of his, I mean, he's done a zillion things, started new disciplines and everything else, but he's always been concerned with the loss of biodiversity on, on planet Earth. And this book says, we've got to save half of planet Earth for nature if we're gonna have life on Earth, period. That's how much we have to save. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. And even nuts like me to say, that's great, let's do it. Say, well, how could that be possible? Half the earth is already in agriculture and 7.8, 7.9 billion of us and all of the infrastructure and roads and airports and everything else is in the other half. We don't have a third half that we could save for the natural world. But I actually believe we can do this. We can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do it. The old approach is humans here, nature someplace else. That's not working. Um, so we now need to, to find a way to coexist with the natural world. The first time in modern history, we humans and all of our, our detritus is gonna coexist with the natural world in the same place at the same time. 
And we're going to do that because it's really our only choice. We don't have any other choice. We need the natural world. It doesn't mean that you have to save insects for a living, although as many of you know, it's a good thing. But you can save them where you live. And, and it empowers you if you do that. Right now, the Earth's problems are so huge that people feel powerless. What can one person do? How can we say, you know, turn things around? One person. Well, one person can reduce the area of their, their yard. One person can put in pollinator garden. One person can get rid of their invasive plants. One person can turn out their lights. They can stop hiring Mosquito Joe. Um, use keystone species. One person can do a lot on the little piece of the earth that they, they manipulate. And if they do, they've regenerated their local ecosystems. Uh, and it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. You don't have to think about the entire planet's problems. Just worry about the piece of the planet you can influence. If you own property that's ours, that's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a park, help a preserve, help a land conservancy. They're all underfunded. They're all, all uh, understaffed. As volunteers, they will, they will work. So insect decline is, is a global problem, but it has a grassroots solution. It's everybody's responsibility on the planet to turn things around. And it's everybody's responsibility because everybody in the planet requires a healthy ecosystem, whether they know it or not. So we created this, we created this problem, but we can solve it. Thanks very much. I don't know if we're doing questions, but if anybody has any. Yes. It's good to see you again, right? Thank you. <laughs> It's, it's an intertwined level because we can't ignore that problem either. They eat the natives, they, they tip the competitive balance against the natives, favor the, the non-natives, big problem. Starting off your talk, partly with agriculture, like you didn't talk about it. Yeah, that, that's another whole talk. Um, you know, right away you say, well, half, half the earth and agriculture, there's nothing we can do about that. That, that is not correct. There's a lot we can do about, about agriculture. One of the most obvious things, we have grandchildren in Portland, Oregon, and we drive across the country once in a while to see them. We just did that. So you, you drive across the country, you've got corn and soybeans and then cows and then the Pacific Ocean, and that, that's it. But along the edges of all of that agriculture, we used to have weeds. That's where the monarch made its population. That's where the, the, you know, the native asters and everything else supported the, the 4,000 species of native bees. Now it's long, unless you're a real low class farmer who's not up to, up to uh, grade in terms of the, the local status symbol. But they've Roundup Ready uh, products means you can spray everything right up to the road and then you plant lawn and then you have to mow it and there's zero habitat. Tens of thousands of square miles of the Midwest is zero habitat because of the grass along our, our agriculture, and it happens here too. Uh, so that's an obvious thing. Put the weeds back, put the hedgerows back, make the hedgerows native plants, use pollinator strips. They're doing great research in Iowa uh, by putting these, these strips in right in the fields that intercept topsoil before it washes into the Mississippi, intercept the fertilizer, intercept the, the uh, herbicide, the herbicides and the, and the uh, insecticides before they get into the watershed, create a, a dead zone in, in the, the Gulf. All those things can happen without, uh, with, with no reduction in productivity or very little reduction in productivity. And if there's a reduction, if somebody takes some, some land out of production in order to put in a pollinator strip, I think we should pay them to do that. I think there should be a pay per use fee just like we pay uh, Netflix to watch a movie, if we're gonna use the earth, we have to pay to do that too. Don't call it a tax, 
It's not allowed. We're just going to use the earth. If you use it, if you live in a city, you're using the earth, whether you know it or not. $10 a year. If everybody in the, on, the, on the US paid $10 a year, that's $8.4 billion we could pay the farmer with and do lots of other important things. And that's one trip to Starbucks. So I don't want to hear that we don't have the money to do it. We can do it. Yes. Do garden centers get my message out? More and more, but um, not entirely. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I was given a talk to a, a, it was a trade show for nurserymen. And this one guy in Illinois there was, was boasting about the fact that he just, he just bought 40,000 Bradford pears for sale. This was like two years ago. You know, we already know this is not a good idea, but he's going to make a buck before it's banned. Um, so not everybody's not on board, which, by the way, is why the nursery industry actually wants bans on particular plants so that everybody has to do it. So you don't have the one cheater who's going to make a lot of money from it, because don't depend on the public to say, I'm not going to buy that. They don't know. Unfortunately, because of our educational system, the ecological uh, uh, IQ of the US public is, is about a one on a scale of one to 10. And it's not their fault. Actually, the little, you know, the little guys know more about it now than their parents. So it's improving, but there are cases where top-down regulation is needed. Yeah. Sure. I mean, everything has more associated with it where it came from than where it goes. Um, Canada, Canada goldenrod, Solidago canadensis, is a huge invasive plant in Europe because nothing's using it there. It's everywhere. They hate it. Remember, here it supports 110 caterpillars. It's a very productive plant. And that doesn't mean that everything supports a lot where they come from. Um, there are plants that support very little, no matter where they are. Ferns are one of them. Ginkgo is another one. Even in China, where it's a really old plant, the really old guys learn how to protect themselves because, you know, for a zillion years, everything's been, been eating them. Uh, but yeah, if I wanted to find the true level of herbivory, I would go to where it came from, hoping that there's an intact ecosystem there. And I'd be in trouble in China because it's not too much left. Yes. We, we did a congeneric comparison, a common garden experiment with 18 congeners, where we had a non-native member of a native, native genus. And on average, uh, insect herbivory was reduced 50%. When we did unrelated plants, it was reduced 75%. So yes, congeners support more than if they're not, not related. And that's on average. So there are exceptions, willows, for example, weeping willow supports uh, almost as much as the straight species willow. It didn't support any galls, by the way. It was only the native species that were supporting the galls. Um, crab apples, a lot of them are hybrids with natives and non-natives. Anything that hybridizes itself, like willows, like crab apples, like oaks, are so similar chemically that a lot of our insects can use it. I just had an undergrad though compare 16 species of oaks, or Bibri on 16 species of oaks. Right there. Quercus Sagittarius, the, the sawtooth oak from this. China. <laughs> um, it was ranked second, second to last. I can't figure out how and to turn it off. The reason it had Herbibri at all is because it was phone. Japanese beetle. I mean, it's still long. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so there is a loss. There's a loss. It's not, they're not the same. Exactly. Those are two good examples, camellias and Japanese privet. Japanese privet is highly invasive. 
So for that reason alone, you, that, you know, we got to give up the aesthetics. Uh, chameleons are not. Uh, we did another study, Desiree Narango, in, in uh, right in suburbs of DC here, looking at chickadee sustainability in yards with a lot of natives versus yards with a lot of introduced ones. And none of them were 100% either way. Um, and she found out that, that you could sustain chickadee populations um, with the insects in that yard if it was 70% native woody plant biomass. That's where the chickadees are foraging, which meant 30%, and that was, that's a high estimate. Could be non-native, could be your camellias, could be your ginkgo, as long as it's not dominating the landscape, then there's enough things for the chickadees to be able to reproduce. Of course, the more natives you have, the bigger the, the supply of food, the more birds you can have there. But it suggests there's an opportunity for, for um, compromise. Uh, and I think that's a good word. I know Congress doesn't, but I think it's a good word uh, because if my message was you can't use any, any non-natives at all, you'd only be here for the food. So. Yes. I want a new industry to pop up everywhere. We'll call it ecological landscapers, ecological gardeners, wherever. Most people don't garden at all. They hire someone. They hire the mow, blow, and go guys. I want to be able to hire these people who will know all this. Um, it's not immediately obvious to everybody. They'll know how to mulch with the leaves without burning them or putting them out as trash. Um, it's not that hard to learn. I could learn it. Um, so. That's what we need. And then the general public, they don't have to worry about it. You know, they just, it's, it's going to be standard landscaping. We're not there yet, but I think we're headed in the right direction. So. Yes. We got a lot of native grass, particularly worm season bunch grasses. Um, it's if you have you know, some space, that's the preferred breeding site for a lot of our, our uh, ground nesting birds, things like meadowlark and, and uh, uh, grasshopper sparrow and things. That, they're all in decline, bob links. Um, but those you don't walk on. They're bunchy, they're clumpy, and it's if you're going to get a grass and mow it, it doesn't matter whether it's native or not. I, I say cut the area of lawn in half, but manicure the half that you keep because then you're still within the cultural bounds of your neighborhood and you're not going to be sighted. Um, it's a cue for care. It is pretty. It's a good place to walk. Uh, so the vegetation's not giving you ticks when you brush up against it. There's a lot of pluses to it. Um, so notice I say reduce the area of lawn instead of get rid of it. There are important landscape functions of traditional cool season European grasses uh, that native grasses really wouldn't fill. They could be part of what you put back in that 50% you're taking out. They should be part of it. They have good winter interest. Uh, you know, all the skippers eat them and things like that. But somebody else? Yeah. I think you know, it's a law that says native grasses are allowed to it's brand new. Maryland has passed the law that says your HOA can no longer <laughs> tell you to do that. You still might make a lot of a lot of enemies, but uh, yeah, 
but yeah, Maryland's ahead of the curve with that. They really are. It's great. Yeah. We had it. <laughs> you know why we have spotted lanternfly? Because we brought rocks from China. We brought ornamental rocks from China because there are no ornamental rocks in North America. Only in Pennsylvania where the rocks are the rocks. Crazy. Yeah, actually, Pennsylvania has been the site of several. That was Mile a Minute, too. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Get rid of Pennsylvanians. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, we keep coming up with new, new uh, families of insecticides. Remember when neonics were great? Remember when DDT was great? You don't remember, but yeah. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you very much. That was that was that was great. <laughs> Let's see. Hello, hello. No. You can hear. Yeah. It's okay. Oh, well, all I was going to say is uh, this has been wonderful. Um, it it it's really is a, a great honor to have had you uh, present and 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 give your talk. And the food was amazing. The company was great. Please stay uh, and get your books and sign them. Uh, please enjoy some more uh, of the beverages and uh, there's some dessert. So thank you very much.